It doesn't matter whether I weigh 150 pounds or 350 pounds. And I'm you weigh 350? Mm-hmm. 375. 375. He'll brag. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, my name's Nadia. Thanks for coming to hang out on this video with me. I'm not actually gonna be in this video, but I wanted to introduce myself because you guys have been watching my videos for a little while now and I'm gonna be in future ones and it just feels like time. So see you in the future, but not the rest of today. For today's video, I wanna take a break from the 2022 fat acceptance movement and take a look at the dysfunction that's been present from the very beginning of all of this. I think that a lot of the history of this movement actually explains why it looks the way it does in 2022. Society feels that we can really change. Black people can change. Um, other minority uh, groups, other ethnic background, people with ethnic backgrounds, they can change. Fat people can change. I'm going to focus on the first 30 years, the first two waves of fat activism. Specifically, we're going to look at who's credited with actually starting it, what their explicit intentions were from the beginning, and what they've actually accomplished as a result of these intentions. Despite the popular narrative among fat activists today, it was not marginalized women of color who began this. There are three main white men credited in most every origin story for fat acceptance. Steve Post, who held the infamous Fat Inn in 1967 in Central Park. He actually later went on to say that it was more of a publicity stunt than an actual protest, according to Bill himself here. Nevertheless, this protest inspired Lou Lauderbeck to write the article, More People Should Be Fat, published in the Saturday Evening Post. After reading this article, a man who was married to a larger woman and who identified as a fat admirer named Will Fabry found in NAFA, the National Association to Aid Fat Americans, in 1969. The official NAFA story is that Bill was inspired by Stephen Liu's work and that inspiration mixed with the frustration he experienced on behalf of the way the world treated his overweight wife led to the creation of this self-proclaimed civil rights organization and movement. Sounds friendly enough, but let's hear from the man himself what some of his own personal motivations were at the time. All right, going back a minute, what would motivate me to be even interested in the subject at all? Well, I told her that it, in, in school, I realized, I think I realized in, 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 when I was in kindergarten that I like, was attracted to chubby girls. In the course of being attracted to the larger ladies, um, I develop, uh, developed a lot of anger about, about it, be, about the fact that, you know, that I had to be in the closet about it, that I, um, I'm not gay myself, but I totally relate to them because I have, uh, as a man who has always admired the larger figure in a woman, I always felt the si similar pressures on me that, that I realized that you know, gays must encounter when they're growing up. I'll get into that a little bit later because part of my, my motivation and my anger was that, you know, how dare anybody tell me what I should find attractive. That interview is really what got me digging. It just kind of felt weird hearing that from the guy who started this fat acceptance movement. And it made me think, what kind of stuff did this organization get into if the president and founder is someone whose personal interests are rooted in their special preference for larger bodied women? We have a name for those type of men, but it's not YouTube friendly. So we're going to call men who have very special preferences for full figures, fat admirers. This civil rights group did something unique in that they appealed not just to those who they were advocating for, for membership, but they also advertised themselves to the people who were especially interested in dating the group that this organization advocated for. And that's a little weird, right? Imagine the NAACP recruiting black Americans and also the white men who feel they have to be closeted in their preference for black women. Imagine those being your allies, the men who want to sleep with you. What are they going to do for your cause? Let's find out. The fat admirer agenda really dominated the space for the first 30 years, in my opinion. And because of that, I think their most lasting impact has been normalizing the heterosexual preference of larger bodied women. It's very hard when people ridicule the type of women that you like and say they're ugly and they laugh at you when you walk with them arm in arm down the street. Some people like to look at fat people. I love to look at a fat woman on the beach. If I saw Marilyn Monroe or Gina Lillibridge on the beach, they turn me off. It's just like looking at a bull. 
and NAFA themselves did the work to provide access to those larger women. It started from the very beginning with their newsletter in 1971, which we can think of as basically the only social media they had at the time. In this very first newsletter, they announced that they would be hosting a dating service called NAFA Date. It was advertised as a way to link fat people and the people who admire them. NAFA Date remained part of this organization for 30 plus years. The past five decades of NAFA, dating has played dating, sex, attraction, um, particularly for heterosexual folks, has played a role. Their official dating service was followed soon with personal ads, pen pal programs, and advertisements for pinup calendars or provocative photos that you could order directly through them. Again, we're talking about a civil rights organization, and it was actually the introduction of NAFA Date that tapped Lou Lauderbeck out, according to Bill himself. At that time, when we started that, Lauderbeck dropped out because he said, I don't, I, he, he said, I think you have important work to do, but I don't want to be involved in something that is, is going to end up being distracted by a dating service. That was a smart move, in my opinion. Lou still played a role in NAFA, though, and NAFA heavily promoted his book, Fat Power, along with another book called Sex and the Overweight Woman, from a distinguished physician, a remarkable plan for weight control through the joys of physical love. And the book is apparently as bad as it sounds. NAFA was circulating a book to his members that basically said, a woman becomes overweight when she's deprived of physical love one way or another. It was more fat admirer agenda in my opinion. Right away, they also began hosting national conventions. And these original conventions are the stuff of legend among older NAFA members who like to reminisce online. They're referred to as the original BBW bashes, and the men who attended them were always well outnumbered by the women, apparently. The way guys and older heads talk about it is like they were mostly big adult parties after the speeches and workshops. One man at a 96 convention described it like this. Inside every fat person is a volcano waiting to erupt. The men here, the fat admirers, just stand back and wait for the lava to flow. But look around this room, she said, and you can't deny there are many attractive women here. This model bride was attractive enough to catch the fancy of the man who stands beside her. They were married a year ago. I'm happy with my husband. I'm happy with my life. I'm me. It doesn't matter whether I weigh 150 pounds or 350 pounds. And I'm you weigh 350? Mm-hmm. 375. 375. He'll brag. <laughs> sounds like some productive activist work to me. The special socializing that took place at dances, pool parties, mealtimes seemed to be the actual draw to these conventions. And speaking of mealtimes, according to a reporter who attended in 79, there was a strict rule against photographing anyone while they ate. And I found that really interesting, mainly because one of NAFA's most prominent board members, Conrad Blickensorfer, was and is an established feeder. Again, allegedly. And the act of feeding is something that many alleged to have enjoyed at NAFA conventions. A feeder is someone who takes extreme pleasure in feeding larger women or men and directly contributing to their weight gain. Conrad actually established himself as the godfather of feederism through the work he did directly with NAFA. Conrad was a major player in NAFA for about 30 years. He served as vice president in 1986 and as chairman and board member over different periods. In NAFA circles and outside many of them, Conrad is credited with being one of the most significant contributors to NAFA and fat acceptance as a whole. And as a NAFA leader, I think his most significant work came from a special interest group he started called the Fat Admirer Special Interest Group or the FA SIG. The F.A. SIG was headed and edited by Conrad, and it really was a special project because even though there were other special interest groups in NAFA, including a feminist one, the fat admirers are the only ones who got their own illustrated newsletter. And obviously the illustrations were pretty special too, huh? So the newsletter was full of fanfic basically, personals, education, and more illustrations. This little NAFA magazine turned into a real magazine called Dimensions in 1988. 
again, edited by our NAFA board member, Conrad B. And it was still obviously circulated in NAFA, but it made its way outside of NAFA too. This NAFA-born publication has one of the most highly established feeder and BBW reputations on the internet, and that was especially true in its prime. The magazine itself began featuring full-color photos of real BBW models in lingerie and other provocative imagery. It was advertised to men and women, but there was obvious purpose to this magazine that was much more geared to heterosexual men's desires. We have to remember that while Conrad was creating this BBW and feeder empire, he was an integral member to a civil rights organization, and all of this work he accomplished only through this civil rights group. He found his target audience fast and capitalized off this movement in a way few others have, except maybe Bill himself, who in 1988 created the company Ample Stuff, which sells specialty products to obese people. Again, he's a skinny man at this time. His company was incredibly successful in the very beginning and still is successful now, just less relevant than before. Bill might rival Conrad and people who have profited the most from fat acceptance, and they're both thin white men. Well, Bill isn't anymore, but he was. Yeah, I was a lot skinnier then too. We're not done talking about dimensions though, because Conrad accomplished a lot with this NAFA-born publication. One of the first sensations of Dimensions Magazine was the 500 Club, an exclusive club that Conrad created for women over 500 pounds who wanted to model for them. His second member of the 500 Club actually passed away a few years after she was featured, allegedly, and aside from removing her images from their website, they never said anything or paid tribute to her. Conrad also began releasing wide-angle videos on the Dimensions website, which were basically softcore SSBBW vids. I should mention, by the way, that the Dimensions website became a BBW forum in the late 90s for fat admirers and BBWs to link up, and those forums are where I found and learned a lot. Conrad is actually still active from time to time on them, funny enough. And he actually met his wife from a personal ad posted in BBW magazine. One of the beginning BBW video series Conrad released was called The Feeding Fantasies of Betsy. They were videos released incrementally where you could watch Betsy get fed and gain weight over the months. And this is where our NAFA chairman established himself as the godfather of feederism. Conrad's videos were many men's very first introduction into the erotic world of feederism, and they were absolutely enamored. Again, we have to think about this being the very beginning of the internet with no social media. People in the forums I visit describe waiting for these video sets like kids on Christmas morning when there was finally a new video up and it was clear that weight had been gained. Now, we have to sidestep here because in the late 90s, early 2000s, NAFA officially put out a statement condemning the act of feederism. You tell me how you think that went over in a group that was almost 50% fat admirers, and this is the content that was born directly of that group. It didn't go over well, especially because the act of feeding is something many alleged to have enjoyed within NAFA and at NAFA parties and conventions. If they get there, believe me, they enjoy it. <laughs> After NAFA put out this statement and got rid of their dating service, a lot of their membership plummeted and Conrad himself left. And this in a pretty notable way marked the decline of NAFA. And that makes sense to me because in my opinion, NAFA was sort of doomed from the start. When your president's only real stake in your organization's cause is his desire to feel more normal about his preferences, what do you think that president's work is gonna revolve around? In my opinion, the first 30 years of NAFA was actually very successful at progressing the status and quality of life for that of the fat admirers, and not so much the status and quality of life of fat people. That's not just my opinion, though. In this article published in Dimensions Magazine in 1999, our new NAFA executive director, Sally Smith, answers the question, in the first 30 years, has NAFA really made a difference for fat people? She concludes, overall, it's a hard question to answer. But Conrad's answer to this question, for us admirers of the large figure, things have definitely changed for the better. After seeing everything we've seen today, it's no mystery as to why that is. 
these Napa men worked hard to normalize their preferences and create new paths to satisfying those preferences. Now jump to the year 2022 and we get yelled at almost every day about how thin white people are inserting themselves in a movement that was never about them. Sorry, but it seems to me that this movement is only just now becoming about y'all. Dimensions didn't even have its first black model until January 2000. And this third wave of hay style fat activism actually shut down those who remained from the second wave as soon as they started with all the fake health and science claims. At least that's what I've read online. They felt like they didn't sign up for that BS, and we know that today that BS is basically all that's left here in this movement. I'm going to wrap the video up here for today. I'm probably going to do some follow-ups to this depending on questions and response that I get. I did so much research for this, but I couldn't include everything because I wanted to keep it short and interesting. So we'll see depending on how the video does. Thank you so much for coming to hang out on this video. I'll see you in the next one. Take care until then.